You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at OklahomaHOF.com and definitely on Instagram at OklahomaHOF. Let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, host, back with an ep- another episode down at the OKC Thunder Arena for the first time uh, this year. It's I always love coming in here, but coming in here when it's quiet and there's no one here, it's, I don't know, it's something special about it. But return guest today, Brian Burns is back on the podcast, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Uh, we spoke, wow, three years ago. <laughs> It's been a while. Uh, a lot has changed since then, but um, we've pa- we, we've caught up a few times in passing uh, at the Hall of Fame induction last year, and saw you at Stitch the other day having a coffee. That's right. Great, That's local, right. great local coffee place. But um, yeah, thank, thanks for having me down. Excited to kind of recap and, and, and catch up on, on what's happened in the last three years since we last spoke and how, you know, like the, the background of everything that works at the Thunder, not, you know, everything that's off the court, you know, you, the marketing, all the stuff that goes on. I mean, you've had a huge name change. Like it's, you've been busy, right? Well, three, you say three years since we've last yeah. met on this. And in, in the world of COVID, it feels like 30 years, <laughs> right? And, and that maybe will form a lot of our discussion today, yeah. just how much has changed and, and how much we've had to change, want uh-huh. to change, need to change. And even just in your opening comments there, you know, we're, doing this uh, this morning from Paycom Center. Yeah. And that in and of itself is a great change for the organization. I have a fabulous partner like Paycom with a long-term commitment to this team and this organization and just everything that they represent as a business Uh and their vision forward really aligns with how the Thunder has always thought about itself and our vision forward. And so we find ourselves kind of in this post-COVID, you know, what's next um, with a lot of new things, a lot of wind behind our back. And I think the identity change of Paycom Center is one of the kind of the broader manifestations of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, for people listening, just to kind of recap shortly uh, what we cho- spoke about in the last podcast we did, and I'll link that for people below because there's so much valuable information in that just about, you know, because you came here, you know, from the Sonics, right, on, you know, on an alias, I think is what you said, to, right. to, you know, during, I guess, um, you know the 09, 08 kind of situation that happened with with the economy, and and I mean you told some great stories. So I'll link that below for people to go back and talk about building the Thunder brand, you know, from nothing back then. And that's that's great information in that. We won't talk about that too much now because it's already out there. And people listening, I'll definitely link them to that, and they'll really enjoy hearing about that and hearing about why you picked the color scheme and, and Rumble and the Thunder Girls and just the whole brand side of things, which as a marketing person myself, like really excites me because you know people see the team they see playing and they watch it they don't think about you know the decisions that goes into making the logo the color scheme and and having you know the sponsors or the partners that you have so we'll we'll link that one below you guys can check that out that was a great conversation we did a few years ago coming forward i mean you you mentioned it paycom center talk a little bit about that i mean the, the change that that happened and you know i think the day that the lights were turned on it was kind of a foggy day in oklahoma and everyone thought that you know, i think it was independence day or something in oklahoma because there was just this green glow over downtown <laughs> so well paycom uh joined the organization as a partner uh, a year or two before covid uh-huh. and so we were able to start a relationship with their executive team and really learn more about what their marketing platform uh was at the time and how it was growing and and it was a really pivotal moment uh, in in retrospect because they were um, um, they were not spending a lot of marketing dollars in in these spaces yet. Mm-hmm. Um, they were um, using uh, the Thunder platform in a way at the time uh, to really start to explore a much broader uh, reach and, and and platform and using sports as a vehicle uh, to hit their target audiences and and their key objectives and. In the course of working with them and learning more about the the organization and, and about their values and about just their vision forward, um, we started to really develop a much bigger appetite for working together. Mm-hmm. And they were becoming more aggressive in what they wanted to accomplish, and that was lining up well with what we were thinking about. And somewhat just you know fortuitously, um, Chesapeake, which was our partner for 13 years mm-hmm. and had the name on the building for 10. Uh, was uh, anticipating a bankruptcy. And you think about the value of relationships in business and in life. Mm-hmm. 
th- there's a great story inside of this, and that is that we had a terrific relationship with Chesapeake, uh, with their people, with their key leadership, with their executive team. Mm-hmm. And we had done so many amazing things together um, in the community and through marketing platforms and just trying to have a broader impact uh, in Oklahoma and Oklahoma City, that there was a lot of trust there. And Chesapeake came to us early in the process and said, this is where this is headed. Uh, We're going to eventually take this thing into bankruptcy Mm -hmm. um, because it's best for our business and it'll help us recapitalize and and we'll we'll be able to come out of this in a much bigger place. But that will allow us Mm -hmm. this unique opportunity to kind of pause uh, where they were as a business. We were grateful for that because it gave us an opportunity to be proactive, to be strategic, and to really think about, okay, what's best for the, for the thunder now as we move forward? And rather than react to something or potentially be on our heels mm-hmm. and have to go to the market um, and potentially start from just a position of you know zero, no strength. Yeah, and then desperation too. We were able to be know? very proactive. Yeah. And we talked to brands uh, with national scale. We talked to brands in and out of Oklahoma. Um, it was a unique opportunity for us to really explore what's next. Mm-hmm. The reality is Paycom's right here in Oklahoma City, uh, one of the fastest growing companies in the Fortune 500 list, um, born and raised here in Oklahoma. Um, uh, Chad Richardson, the, the, the founder and the CEO, uh, from Oklahoma, very strong Oklahoma values and roots. Um, a great story in and of himself of an entrepreneur who mm-hmm. just bootstrapped his way into um, this unbelievable story. and were thinking about their own growth uh, as a business and as a brand. And the more we talked to each other, the more it was really obvious that we need to be together. We need to use each other as a platform for for growth. And one of the things that's really, uh, I think, struck us as a powerful um, kind of uh, illustration of this is that they also represent what's next. They're a financial technology innovation company. They're in the human capital management business, they're Mm -hmm. in the payroll business, but they, they represent so much more than that. And their ideation and their technology and their innovation it will have huge impact on how we think and yeah. how we work together. And it represents a little bit to the marketplace of the next generation of you know the economic diversity and growth mm-hmm. in Oklahoma. Uh, oil and gas and agriculture have always been yeah. the backbone of our of our state and will continue to be for obviously for generations. It's a very important um, resource. But financial performance, innovation, technology, th- those kind of things that, that Paycom represents helps us to really look forward. Mm-hmm. And we've been galvanized by that. Um, they have several thousand employees locally right here in Oklahoma City. So they have a young workforce. They have a workforce that looks a lot like our ta- target audience. Um, we think there's a lot of potential here uh, to work together from a marketing uh, perspective. But it also allows us to do a lot of things together in the community. Paycom's very community-centric. They're very uh, aware of their leadership position as a brand in our community. We've always championed ourselves as a, uh, as a leader in our, in our community. And so working together with them, we think, has just really great potential. And so we're really excited about yeah. where this is going. And it's more than just a naming rights thing. Right, yeah, It's yeah, really yeah. about a partnership. It's about a relationship. Mm-hmm. It's about two brands that trust each other. And... Just to close the thought there, you, you mentioned that first day, that foggy morning yeah. uh, with the lights. You know, that was also a very important um, tactic for the partnership, that we needed to reinvent what mm-hmm. this looked like, that Paycom was not just putting their name in, in, in a position where Chesapeake had a name. That, yeah. that was not the, 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 the plan or the promise. And adding that lighting infrastructure to the building and in, 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 in part just kind of repositioning the arena mm-hmm. as the center of a city, the heart of the city. And it was in the midst of the Omni Hotel opening and the convention center yeah. opening and Scissortail Park, you know, entering its first full year. There was a, just an enormous amount of excitement and enthusiasm and energy mm-hmm. around downtown. And the lighting infrastructure was a part of announcing ourselves um, yeah. as, uh, as a part of that. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of cool things going on in the last three or four years in Oklahoma City and, and you know, all of the, everything you just mentioned, it's it's an exciting part, exciting place to be, right? Because 10 years ago, there was nothing other than the arena down here, right? Um, and a few hotels, right? Especially south of the arena, right? Sure. Now it's getting, you know, it's getting amazing stuff happening to it and, and it's a joy to come down here I mean you got the farmer's market every weekend for the most part um, people are coming out running walking their dogs and we've had concerts and it's some great restaurants as well so it's you know it's it's really 
I'm sure happy for you guys to welcome people to the neighborhood, right? To make it more of a community rather than just, you know, we're in this giant arena, you know, Paycom Center in the middle of a bunch of concrete parking lots. Well, if you think about just the, the broader story there and, and, and Clay Bennett as the, 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 the managing partner and, and one of the owners of the team constantly reminds us like the building and the team and maybe in that order mm. have been transformative for our city and state. Yeah. And so it's more than it's just a building and it's not just, you know, who we are. We've been a catalyst for mm -hmm. changing the economic and, and cultural kind of renaissance of, of the city. Yeah. And to your point, it's not that it's not that long ago that the arena kind of sat at the end of the city mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of commerce or energy around. And today you look out the south end of this of this arena and there's just a sea of humanity. People are walking across the street, the cars are parking, people are in the park, people are at the coffee shop, people in and out of the hotel, the convention businesses, you know, got thousands of people in and out of there every day and they're walking to the various downtown restaurants and and and, and enjoying the parks and we're right in the middle of that and, yeah. and we get to be connected to all of that. And I think that it's a really um, powerful visual for us to be reminded that the Thunder is now a part and connected to a much broader ecosystem of entertainment and yeah. commerce and um, and uh, and a lot of the elements that make living and working in Oklahoma City mm -hmm. really special. Yeah, from from you know your perspective as a as a marketing you know you've been in marketing in this industry for a long time um, you know since I mean when, when yeah I mean obviously you've been at the Thunder since oh eight oh nine but when did you when did you start in the marketing MBA industry? Well, with the, with the, my with career Seattle. spans almost 30 years now yeah. in, in sports entertainment. Um, joined the the NBA family when I was in Seattle gotcha. uh, in 2005. So um, been quite a journey yeah. just in and of itself. But it also reminds me that, you know, we're, we're concluding our 14th season mm -hmm. here in Oklahoma City. So next year is yeah. the beginning of year 15. That's crazy. And so... Yeah. Another milestone with respect to just like the foundational yeah. elements of, of what the business looks like yeah. and our impact here in Oklahoma. Have you in the in in that time then uh, have you gone through kind of an arena name change or, or a, a huge kind of partner change or was this kind of the first one? Well, here in Oklahoma City, it's it's um, it's the second yeah. uh, change for us. When when we arrived in 2008, the building was entitled as the Ford Center. Gotcha. And Ford had made a significant commitment to the city when the building opened in 2002 mm -hmm. as its yeah. initial uh, founding partner. And so we were a part of the Ford uh, platform for the first year or two, mm -hmm. and then we transitioned to Chesapeake. Yeah. Um, and that was a significant uh, change for us as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Chesapeake, you know, represented at the time. Um, what I think Paycom represents now. Yeah. One of the most dynamic uh, companies in the country, not just in Oklahoma, but it was right. founded here. The employees were based here. There mm -hmm. was a, an enormous energy around working for Chesapeake. It was a, yeah. it was a game changer. Uh, if you were, um, you know, looking for not just meaningful employment, but mm -hmm. like working for a brand of, of impact. I think Paycom uh, has that status today. Yeah. And so transitioning to them um, has been a really um, uh, powerful and energizing uh, yeah. transition for us. Yeah, and, and, and you know, to the point, like you, you mentioned, Chesapeake kind of came to you and, and as a, I mean, that served you a huge blessing, really, just saying that, you know, they didn't want to leave you guys dead in the water. And that, served, you know, that, that just shows the relationship that was there for that time for them to come to say to you and say, look, you know, we're going to be out and, you know, the, giving you a heads up, like it's time you guys start looking. What, um, you know, in that process of, of finding, you know, I know you mentioned you'd previously been working with Paycom and they'd already been a part of kind of the Thunder family, you know, who, I guess, who was that short list of, of companies and, and was it, you know, super important for you guys to find an Oklahoma company? Because a lot of people, you know, probably don't just think about it, but when you think about it, there are some incredible companies in Oklahoma City, in Oklahoma in general, worthy and at the level to to you know to partner with an arena and put their name on it so you know you got i mean sonic they sold out sold last year i think was it but they were sonic over here and you know you've got Harold ham doing his thing and i mean there's there's plenty of big business here absolutely and, so. and i think the key learning for us through this process and, and maybe a reinforcement to mm -hmm. us in this process is that you start from the ba the basics this is a business yeah and we have business objectives and they're revenue based and you, you have to obviously very, be very strategic about how you're trying to maximize your revenue, how you're trying to maximize those opportunities to run your business. Mm -hmm. And I think the key learning for us is that there's a fine line there where you can, you can, um, you can look at it as a commodity mm -hmm. if, if you're not careful. 
And so your naming rights position or any other uh, you know, um, uh, attribute that you're trying to sell, whether it's tickets or it's advertising or, mm-hmm. or marketing platforms, you have to be, we constantly are asking ourselves all the time, yeah. how do we create authentic and meaningful and genuine relationships mm-hmm. with the season ticket member, with the casual consumer, with the fan that attends the youth basketball clinic, or somebody who's your naming rights partner? Mm-hmm. And it's important to us. If, if you commoditize that, you've lost yeah. trust. You, you, you're, you're just now performing to a metric that is going to be judged in a very black and white environment. Mm-hmm. You either met the key objective or you didn't. And this business has the opportunity to be so much more than that, mm-hmm. that you can have these elements that are relational, that are trustworthy, that help to elevate brands and have huge impacts. Mm-hmm. And I do think it favors the local brands. I, I, we, we, we're looking at brands all over the country that have ginormous marketing platforms, and there was a lot of interest in this. Yeah. The, the, this is, there's scarcity in how many NBA venues you can have your name on. Yeah. So we certainly had leverage. We certainly had a unique uh, opportunity to take to the market. And we talked to some of the most sophisticated uh, uh, organizations uh, that helped to sell these assets mm-hmm. in, in the country. We also talked to the, the State Department of Commerce as they are actively recruiting new business all the time to mm-hmm. move into the state of Oklahoma. We have a terrific relationship with, with that team. Um, and we work with them on an almost daily basis on just you know what's coming next and how do we help support their marketing and and business objectives how can you know their work influence ours so mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of opportunities here at the end of the day having a local brand is a difference maker yeah. because there's more authenticity there's more interest in what i would call the ancillary elements of mm-hmm. the business model it is about your community it is about the employees it is about using it as a recruiting tool mm-hmm. it's more than just a retail platform and, and I think that that is why most naming rights deals typically favor the local brands, whether mm-hmm. that's your local city or it's your local state, or sometimes local co- might mean a region. Yeah. But typically those things are advantageous um, rather than just a marketing platform for a brand that has you know very specific and sometimes very narrow business objectives. Mm-hmm. It becomes, um, I think, harder to perform to that. Whereas in this case, with Paycom, almost on a daily basis, we're working with them to help continue to yeah. mature and nurture the relationship to make sure that we're helping to advance their business. Yeah. From a branding perspective, then, uh, I mean, there's no secret that Paycom is green, right? You know, and, and, and the green and blue, like that was, I mean, from, again, a marketing perspective, like that's a clash usually. How was that navigated? Because I know that we've had some, I mean, the floor is the same now, but um, you changed the floor for a little bit too, right? Went to kind of a neutral gray, gray color as well, and that... Uh, that looked awesome. I was a huge fan. Some people went, but I thought it looked great. But as far as like kind of like a color scheme thing, how how was those talks, and how long was the talks before what well, you know with Paycom before you knew? Well, I guess before it was announced, like you had a long time to plan yes. this stuff. It, 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 I'm not sure I can actually put like a real time frame on that because they were uh, already a partner. Yeah. Prior to the actual naming rights uh, platform, so. These discussions were largely fluid over a long period of time. I would say the actual, like, let's really connect, let's really talk about this, uh, was probably about a Mm nine-month process, which in and of itself is pretty quick when you think about the scale of this type of investment. I I think there's um, many examples that that this could have taken years to Mm -hmm. put together. Uh, 18 to 24-month cycles is is not unheard of uh, for something of this magnitude. So nine months is relatively quick to be able to work through it. Um, and so we're proud of the fact that, that both parties really were, were dialed in and, and doing the right thing here. You know, from the color scheme, it is interesting. You know, green is, is, a, is a very important part of Paycom's identity. Blue is an important part of the soul of the thunder. Mm-hmm. And so we did have to find the appropriate ways to bring those two together. And in fact, um, by adding the Paycom green to the building, it, it actually gave us an opportunity to enhance the blue. Gotcha. And so we've strengthened some of the blue lighting infrastructure around the side of the building, and we've really strengthened some of the blue accents in the building yeah. to help complement uh, what Paycom is doing from their branding perspective. Mm-hmm. So it can be viewed, obviously, through the lens of just the color prism, greens and blues and, and those kind of things. But it's also about giving both brands an elevated yeah. perspective. And I, and I think that, A, we feel very confident we have found the, the right mm-hmm. balance so that both brands are elevated and Paycom needs to scream to the public because that's what they've purchased. I mean, yeah. they, they are the title partner to the venue. 
but this is also the home of the thunder. Mm -hmm. And so we, we found the right balance. And I think B, I think that'll always be where the partnership um, is best aligned, is that these are two brands that are working in partnership. This is not just a advertising purchase. This is a partnership. And I think over the course of a 15 year relationship, there's going to be lots of opportunities to evolve that and to work together and to mature it. And my guess is if you're sitting in this venue six to 10 years from now, things will probably look a lot different. Right. Whether it's a different scoreboard or it's a different uh, floor scheme or if it's a different, uh, you know, positioning of the Paycom brand in and around the the arena. I think that's part of what both parties should always strive to do Mm -hmm. is to keep uh, the brands positioned in a healthy manner, in in a very, you know, positive manner, but also to evolve as things move. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, like you mentioned, we're going into our 15th year and like I said, you know, look at what's happened in the last 15 years and then look going to the future, you know, you you can't help but be excited about where where the, the franchise is going, you know, with the partners and and just what this what this location stands for in the city of Oklahoma City and, and the state as well. You know, it's it's not just about people who come here, people who pay, you know, tickets. It's about people, you know, the millions or hundreds of thousands of people who watch it on TV too, right? You know, it's and that's that's the exciting part, I, I guess, about your job is it's not just about the people that come to games. It's every other person that you see wearing a thunder hat or a beanie or and around the world you know I, I had a conversation with matt Payne um a few months ago and he was saying that he went to new zealand um a couple of years ago with his dad and just he would wear a thunder hat and everyone was you know going steven adams steven adams you know, it's it's global isn't it you know especially if you go to new zealand it's one of the um, great benefits of this relationship to the nba mm-hmm. the nba is a global property yeah. and it's arguably the second most popular sport in the world behind soccer or football, yeah. however you, I know you call it football. I call it football, yeah. <laughs> um, but the NBA is a, is a global property. Yeah. And the Thunder is one of only 30 teams yeah. that belong to this mm-hmm. great fraternity called the NBA. And so it's not lost on us that that's one of the, the, the great things on behalf of Oklahoma mm-hmm. and Oklahoma City is that we get to represent that to the world. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, it's so much bigger than just the game itself. It's about how we represent ourselves. It's how we're an asset to the State Department of Commerce. When they go and they recruit, you know, Canoe, you know, the new car manufacturer to to join the state. And it's a huge economic driver and and employer Mm -hmm. in our state. Well, the Thunder was involved in a lot of those conversations to help portray to that particular company that if you're a part of the Oklahoma business environment, that you have access to this really cool platform, whether mm-hmm. it's an advertising opportunity or whether it's about tickets and entertainment for their their business objectives, or if it's yeah. just the employees that see that you know this is a great place to potentially move and to live and to mm-hmm. you know be a part of a community. We can be any and all of those things. And Matt Payne's story resonates with me because I hear it almost every day from yeah. people that say they were you know in a cab in St. Louis or they were in Sri Lanka. And, you know, the thunder resonates and people will acknowledge each other with a thunder up Mm -hmm. and it's a T-shirt or it's a hat. And, you know, just in a few hours, I'm going to be in a in a quarterly orientation for new employees. We we do this, obviously, on an ongoing basis. And one of the stories that we tell new employees all the time is something akin to, to this story. And that is that we can never forget that even 14 years into this. The, the, the backbone of this brand is respect for people. Mm-hmm. And so when somebody is wearing a Thunder t-shirt at, at, you know, at, a, at a farmer's market on a Saturday morning or somebody's wearing a Thunder hat uh, while they're shopping or you see somebody in a bar or restaurant and they're watching the Thunder game, it's incumbent upon the Thunder staff to mm-hmm. recognize that person, to never take it for granted. And so you know a, a Thunder up or a fist bump uh, may sound trite or trivial in, in, in this day and age, but for us, it's the authenticity of respecting the fan mm-hmm. because it's it's so much more than just whether we're playing basketball or not. Yeah. This is about a, a brand of influence, and it's about an important part of what makes Oklahoma special. Mm-hmm. And just something as innocuous as you know, recognizing somebody's fandom for taking the time to put yeah. the Thunder shirt or the Thunder hat on, that's an important part of how the Thunder shows respect and shows appreciation for that type of support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I mean, today, you know, today, people, if people are watching the video, they can see a lot of things going on around the arena. We're in the arena. If you're listening, you probably hear a vacuum cleaner. There's stuff stuff going on. We're moving and shaking. Um, there's a spelling bee here today. It's not the, not the thing I expected to see when we walked in is that you guys are hosting a spelling bee. Um, you know, you guys do massive events, obviously hosting Thunder Games and, and, and other stuff, concerts and all, you know, monster trucks and all the crazy stuff that happens in this arena. There's what thirty seats on the court. I mean, 
in the scale of this building, this is not a big event for you guys. But it looks like for the people coming in, these kids are going to be so excited coming here, seeing their names up in the background. I mean, you guys have gone all out for this event, and I'm sure these kids are you know, thrilled. Talk a little bit of kind of what today's event is and then just kind of events in general. Well, I think that uh, your observation there is, is really interesting, and, and I'm actually really excited that just we chose to do this today, mm-hmm. and it happened to be here to give us a chance to talk about this. Yeah. this. This is about, again, bigger than basketball. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there, there's maybe two different uh, th- thoughts here about how the Thunder looks at this. The first is that this is a response in a post-COVID environment. Mm-hmm. The annual spelling bee has never been held uh, in, in a venue like this. The, the, this is typically going to be in a hotel ballroom or, you know, in some innocuous, you know, in, in event center um, as a matter of just year after year, you just kind of get into a habit and you do things a certain way. Well, COVID hit in 2020 and it disrupted everything. Mm-hmm. And the spelling bee was trying to figure out how to pivot, just like everybody else. What do we do? How do we continue to deliver this experience? And how do we continue to work with the school systems and the the spelling bee uh, organizers? And how do you solve a problem uh, in that moment of time? Well, a common denominator there is American Fidelity. Mm -hmm. American Fidelity um, is heavily involved in uh, in the schools and in reading programs, and in this particular case, the spelling bee. And they are a partner to the thunder. And so through a course of conversations and opportunities, we uh, offered to host the event here in the arena because we could. The building was available. We have always had eyes open for community impact. And this just aligned with how we are already connected uh, to schools and to youth reading and and, and development programs. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a natural fit. Well, here we are a few years later and we're still doing it, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's become something we're really proud to be in partnership with. And, and to your point, we, we might be sitting in this you know, 500,000 square foot venue uh, and we have 18,000 seats in the building and yet we're hosting 30 kids today. Um, but they're going to have an experience that'll be uh, you know, a lifetime memory for not just the kids and the parents, but everybody involved today. We have all their names up on the LED screen behind me. Uh, Thunder Vision will be here to, to mm-hmm. televise the, the event internally and put them up on the big uh, Thunder Vision. Uh, we actually have them on the court and they have you know, all, all of this like really detailed uh, experiences from how they enter the building and to, you know, how they're hosted and all the accommodations. And it speaks volumes to our entertainment team and our community impact group, our community engagement team of how do you treat people? Mm-hmm. How do you bring people into our ecosystem and deliver an unparalleled experience? We can ask ourselves that on a nightly basis about Thunder Games, mm-hmm. but we also extend that same courtesy and that same amount of detail to a youth basketball clinic or a coding camp at the Thunder Launchpad or a court dedication somewhere in the state of Oklahoma or a spelling bee that for us it's about how do you put the brand out um, and have a huge impact uh, in a very powerful and meaningful way I think the other part of the illustration here is that it's it's also incumbent upon us that we can do things like this Mm -hmm. and help elevate other brands and other organizations and other events and so I think about um, just maybe six weeks ago, there was a really awful story of, uh, of a local high school um, where their basketball gym was flooded. Um, something happened and it, mm-hmm. and it flooded overnight and it ruined the floor. And so the boys and girls basketball team were now stranded without a home and they had to kind of hodgepodge to you know, finish out their, their season. Well, we caught wind of that. And we, uh, through our relationships with the school systems and the um, the public schools, uh, athletic programs, uh, and in partnership with the arena, uh, ASM uh, as the venue operator, we all came together and said, you know, can we host that high school basketball game? And so the boys and girls teams from this high school played their senior night game here at Paycom Center. Oh, that's so cool. And you think about that experience. As a high school athlete, this this is your final game. This is your senior final. Yeah. And uh, you have this terrible disaster that's potentially ruined your season or, or, or changed the yeah. course of your, of your season. And you culminate that experience by playing on the floor of the NBA home team, the Oklahoma City Thunder at Paycom Center, yeah. with all your, you know, the parents and all the friends and all your classmates were here cheering. We had more than a thousand people here uh, cheering on that boys and girls team. And it was just another example of how, how can we be responsive to opportunities in the marketplace? Yeah. How can we leverage our relationships and that trust that we've developed through mm-hmm. uh, all these years uh, of being involved in our community and provide a meaningful experience? Mm-hmm. 
we're also developing Thunder fans. It's not lost on us that that's an yeah. opportunity for us. Not unlike the parents and the and the kids that'll be here today, mm-hmm. they're developing hopefully an affinity for the Thunder um, that'll obviously pay dividends for us down the line. Yeah. Um, that's a part of the equation. But we lead with our heart. We lead with the Thunder way, mm-hmm. and we lead with this ability to have a, an impact in our community. And so, the spelling bee is an example of that. Hosting a basketball game, you know, yeah. on a on a Tuesday night in February is is an example of that, and then all the other things that we like to be involved in. Yeah, yeah, and and to that point, you know, I did a podcast probably a couple of years ago with Christine Burney uh, and Aaron Oldfield um, about you know because in the Thunder Kids department, and we talked all about the school programs, you know, all about the outreach events and and the Thunder courts that are going out. I mean, how many courts are we at now? It was, I think, I think it was in the 40s last time I asked. Well, I think we're actually at 29. Okay, maybe 29. not. Then it was maybe a f- branded was 14 courts. branded courts yeah. at that point. I knew it was a four somewhere. Yeah. But it's incredible. And, and I, for people listening, I'll link that below as well because it's worth listening to just to hear everything that goes on behind the scenes and, and the outreach through the state. And Rumble's the busiest person in the world driving around in his van. But um, you mentioned, you know, this kind of, this event came from covid Obviously, you know, everybody remembers that night because it was here, right? You know, that how well, the game didn't start, right? Everyone's here and you're like, sorry, guys, like, everyone's got to go home. NBA's just said, no, no, we're done, um, locking it down. I mean, from, from your perspective, what was that day like and, and what do you remember from that? Well, that, that day um, is, is a, a bit of a memory, obviously, but it's also a bit of a learning tool yeah. of, mm-hmm. you know, how do you pivot? How, how do you respond to adversity? You know, here we are, you know, about to produce a game. We've sung the anthem. We've, we've you know, done the player introductions, and we're, we're ready to go. And it's all systems go. Everybody's doing their job. Everybody's dialed in. There were uh, a number of COVID protocols already in place. We had hand sanitizers everywhere. We had signage everywhere. We were doing, at the time, you know, a, a, a lot of what we needed to do in terms of awareness and mm-hmm. proactive uh, efforts on health and, and safety and cleanliness. But COVID itself hadn't really hit. And, and so here we are about to play that game. And, and then, of course, we pause. And, and uh, now the story's been told, right? I mean, there was, there was a COVID case and, and the NBA, you know, stepped in and in partnership with so many people here in the building, uh, canceled the game. And then ultimately we paused the season and yeah. everything you know, has transpired since then. But the powerful memory that came out of that was just, you know, the, the, the ability to, to be responsive and to pivot. Mm-hmm. And a number of people were involved in just being solution oriented in that moment. How do we communicate? How, how, do we, how do we safely exit the building? How do we then post communicate to people about what this meant or what the next steps might be? Mm-hmm. How do we engage with our team members, our staff, you know, to A, ensure their safety and their, their health? Uh, there was all kinds of uncertainty that night about whether you were in the building or out of the building and what mm-hmm. that meant. Uh, we were on, the, uh, on a conference call within an hour with our partners at OU Health. And they were providing all kinds of guidance to us about yeah. health and safety protocols, uh, how to communicate to our staff, which culminated the next morning in an OU Health executive being in our office addressing our team and talking to us about just the state of COVID and how we should you know, think about yeah. the work that we were going to do. Our uh, internal teams, our HR team and our information technology team uh, responded immediately with resources for the staff to be able to move to a remote work environment and to take your your infrastructure home yeah. which in and of itself was unusual right I mean, yeah. at that moment yeah. in time working uh, in corporate america meant working in an office at a desk and mm-hmm. you know that's where you conducted your work uh, that sounds archaic today but on march 20th that yeah. was work by march 22nd or 23rd we were all equipped to work from home yeah. and that's a huge credit to a lot of folks in our organization that could put those pieces together and help us be responsive and allow us to continue to move the business forward. And that's to communicate with our fans. It was to communicate to our corporate partners. It was to communicate to the community at large about how we could continue to, to do our, our work. And within weeks, uh, we had uh, really matured our health and safety protocols uh, at the time. Uh, we were already back to doing some commun- community events. We were supporting uh, OU Health in particular, we were supporting just the healthcare environment. Uh, we were you know, a, a, a huge megaphone for health and safety messaging, working with um, uh, nurses in particular, getting masks out to the healthcare community. We were using the power of the thunder, uh, both from a, a, a personnel mm-hmm. perspective and just from our, our media uh, perspective to help be an advocate uh, for messaging and, yeah. and programming. And then just continuing to keep the brand alive, yeah. you know, working with our corporate partners to do things that were helping their objectives, 
uh, even before we started playing basketball again later that summer uh, in the bubble in Orlando. So it was a great opportunity for us across all of our business disciplines to think about how do you continue to have a role and to continue to have, be an advocate and yeah. to be a resource in our community uh, beyond basketball. Yeah. And that night, I mean, COVID was such an unknown. But if you come out and, and you know, you got to have – there's a certain way to tell people in, 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 in the best way possible, will you please leave politely and not just be an absolute mass exodus and everyone's rushing to the doors and trampling over people. Like, that's a real issue, you know, because nobody, everyone, I'm sure it was, there was people there were scared, uncertainty, you know, and it, for something like that to happen here and, you know, everyone you never thinks it's going to happen to you, right? And it right. happens in your arena and, you know, like you said, there's only 30 NBA teams and it happened here first. Like it's speaks to the professionalism yeah. of our what we call our events and entertainment mm-hmm. team. And, and that's the group that, that produces our events and mm-hmm. is largely responsible for all of the staff working in the building that night. Our guest relations team that manage all of the folks that work in a part time capacity with mm-hmm. various vendors that, that work here. Um, but when I think about, you know, the, the, the sense of calm and poise in the moment, you know, I think it, I think of a couple of images. One is. Uh, our owner um, uh, comes out, sits in his seat, yeah. um, and and with his family, as we read the announcement to, that the game has been postponed, and that we would then ask fo- for folks to leave in a in an orderly fashion. To have the owner sitting courtside with a sense of calm and, and poise helped to just set a tone. It's a huge statement for the yeah. environment. And the second image comes to mind is our general manager Sam Presti. You know, he was uh, behind the scenes that night in the in, in, in the bowels of the building, if you will. But he was also very influential in um, helping to communicate, helping to set you know next steps, helping to mm-hmm. organize workflow, and uh, whether it was the teams themselves, you know the Utah Jazz and or the Thunder, yeah. but also just our infrastructure. Just again, helping to organize a sense of what are we going to do, how mm-hmm. are we going to do it, what's our next steps. So the the combination of our executives team, our executive team obviously, and our staff working mm-hmm. together with poise, with confidence, um, with an understanding about you know how to go about the business uh, of, of next steps and avoiding uh, 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 chaos or yeah. avoiding you know the unknown um, again I, I think there's great learnings there it's great great, great mm-hmm. teaching uh, to all of us about how to be responsive in an adverse environment yeah. and I think that you know the Thunder would like to think that we've built a lot of those attributes into our culture and so as we onboard new employees and we teach these stories and we help to Mobilize a, an environment that you know, that allows you to be your best. Um, I, I think that's important to how we think of yeah. ourselves in this environment. Yeah, definitely. From a, from a a kind of fan uh, experience standpoint, you know, your guys' world has been rocked, right? Because of COVID and everything changed. And you know, we're up here in in, in one of the one of the kind of I guess eating areas at the arena, but just down the way was that you know you, you, we just had a look at the dj booth and the whole platform and the experience has changed because of covid and all the other ways that you can interact and not interact and ever changing regulations you know what was that kind of process like of of just having no fans having fans but still you know putting that experience across right because it's easy to just host a basketball game and put it live on tv and then that's it but it's the whole you know it's not why people not the whole reason why people come here, right? There's an experience here. You've got the drummers, you've got Malcolm out there on the floor doing his thing. You know, there's people doing half court shots for money, whatever it is. Like, all of that stuff was like, oh, we can't do this anymore. So, you know, from, from your perspective, how was that? Yeah, it was obviously another great challenge yeah. uh, for the organization and for our team members. Um, but one of the things that, that continued to guide us was a principle that we've uh, just has always been a part of our thought process going back to just the very first day in 2008 create the conditions for success how do you put people in the best position to be successful and one of the ways that we bring that to light is to create the best experience for the nba product and that's our team and so when we're in this environment last year and we have no fans in the building it was still incumbent upon us to create an environment that supported an nba basketball experience and when our players walked out and they they were playing the game, they needed to know that this was still an NBA experience and that has to be fully supported. And so that's all of the things. It's, you know, the scores table and it's the personnel around the court and it's about the infrastructure around the benches and it was about, you know, the cadence of the game and it was about the music playing or it was about the PA announcer or it was about the timeout infrastructure, which is oftentimes the chaos, right? It's the mascot or the Thunder Girls or the drummers or the O-City crew or whatever that may be. What we didn't want is our players to be playing in a vacuum. 
that would have changed the identity of what it means to be a professional athlete playing in Oklahoma City and playing for the Thunder. There's a reputation there that we've worked hard to cultivate. And so we had to pivot and do those things differently. Yeah. So a lot of those things were pre-recorded and they were displayed on the video board rather than in person. But the audio senses to that or just the mm -hmm. ambiance to that felt familiar. And that was one of the feedbacks that we were proud to have earned from our team and, and from the, the, um, uh, uh, the visiting team and, and from the NBA uh, executives that were here was that it felt very familiar. Mm -hmm. And that if you closed your eyes, you know, maybe you wouldn't notice that, that the seats were empty, right. that it felt like an NBA experience. And that was, a, that was a source of pride for our team. We wanted to create that environment, give mm -hmm. our, our, our team and our players you know, the best opportunity uh, to, to play the game and to, yeah. and to you know, feel supported. I think the other thing it did is it really it helped us innovate. It helped us to think differently. We now have uh, probably half of our national anthem performances are pre-recorded. Huh. Some of them are still live. We do the very traditional lights out, center court with a microphone, and there's talent there to perform, and that's yeah. kind of how we've always done it. But half of our games we pre-record, and we've taken the opportunity to take that talent and perform the anthem mm -hmm. from destinations all around Oklahoma City. So now we're helping to showcase and to market other things that are important in our community. Same thing with the invocation. We sometimes have those pre-recorded, but they're originating from um, wherever the invocator may be from. Maybe it's from a church or it's a community organization. Yeah. So we're able to now take what was a, a very traditional in-game experience and elevate it and mm -hmm. add more content behind that. And then just to, to finish the thought, as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're doing this podcast this morning from the Post Oak Party Deck. Well, just... Uh, uh, to our side here is the performance stage. Mm -hmm. Well, at the beginning of this season, with NBA protocols around vaccinations and boosters and mm -hmm. wearing of the mask and all of those things, we were not allowed to have performers on the court. So whether that was Rumble or the DJ or the MC or the Thunder mm -hmm. Girls or whoever that may be, we had to ask ourselves, what's plan B? And so we created an environment. We put a, a, a performance deck. We put lighting infrastructure. We had our, our camera systems, you know, tested yeah. to make sure that we could basically create a stage in the arena now. Mm -hmm. And that was where we performed all of our in-game experiences. Yeah. That's where, you know, so many things can be conducted now. Towards the end of the season, with a lot of the uh, protocols now relaxed or, or, or de-emphasized, we now can be on the court or on the stage. And mm -hmm. so now we've given ourselves a chance to have a more dynamic game presentation. Yeah. And I think that's actually infused a lot of creativity into the brand to think about how we can do things differently. We're not beholden to the old paradigm. We don't have to do things the way we've always done them. We can now see ourselves doing things differently. And I think as we think about just what's going forward, it's going to energize the brand. It's going to energize our partners. It's going to energize our staff. Mm -hmm. And when you're in Paycom Center in the fall of 2022 and you're excited to be at a Thunder game, it's going to look and feel and sound differently mm -hmm. than it's what, it's what it's been in the past. And that's important. That's important for us to show continued growth yeah. and continued maturity as a brand and as an entertainment vehicle. And I think that that's something that really gets us excited. Yeah, and, and to that point, like every business, you've got to consistently evolve and change the experience and make it better, even if it's just a little bit better every day, right? Or every game, it's it's just, you know, enhancing that experience and making people want to come back and bring their family. And, you know, if someone's coming to town, is there a Thunder game? And my parents are coming to town, sadly, in June. And there's no, <laughs> there are no games right now in June. So I was like, oh, well. That's a shame because I'd love to bring them down here. But people like that, you know, there's people coming to town and they're thinking, you know, can I bring my family here? And, and is, there, is there a concert on instead if there's not a game? But there's, there's so much cool stuff to do here, you know, and, and you've said it previously on the podcast and you've said it on our previous podcast too, was it's, it's more about basketball, you know, and it's just being a community partner and, and just driving that and, you know, the, the stuff that goes on outside of the arena, um, you know, that's it, it, even if it's just I mean we've got the marathon coming up you guys are a huge partner of the marathon and I think every time we ran past the, the arena the or the center the the drummers are out and they're passing out hats so the girls are out there clapping cheering you on and it's you're only two miles in but it feels great energized, <laughs> energized. right energized. And, and rumbles the chair bison yeah. you know and it's it that's a good, another great example of how we can bring mm -hmm. uh, our talent and our experiences in the brand 
to others yeah. to help elevate. One plus one always equals three for us. Mm-hmm. And, and that's another example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Finishing up, what are you excited about going forward? And, and you know, the changes that have happened, some have stayed, some have, some have, you know, just happy to get rid of some of the things, right? Some restrictions. But, you know, what are you excited about going forward? Um, you know, and just kind of the state of, of you know, the, the arena or the center in general from your perspective? There's a, a, a real sense of excitement for yeah. next year. And, 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 we're only at the end of March, but we're already envisioning what next October looks like, right? And um, we're very energized. We had a very successful season ticket renewal campaign that just concluded a few weeks ago. We were really excited to see the continued uh, commitment from our, our, our season ticket subscribers. Uh, our corporate partnership base is as solid as it's ever been. In fact, I think we have more partners today that are more engaged than ever before. We've learned a lot through COVID, how to deliver their experiences and their activations differently, which has elevated their their engagement with the Thunder. Um, with the uh, relaxation of a lot of the health and safety protocols, we've been able to really anticipate just a more return to normal. Mm-hmm. And that means a full building. That means you know a higher sense of engagement with the game experience. We're really excited about what we would call kind of the next generation of the Thunder uh, game experience. We're also embarking on uh, what would be the beginning of a multi-year renovation to Mm -hmm. to the arena through the MAPS 4 uh, investment. Um, And so uh, we have new seats coming in over the course of the next 18 to 24 months. So brand new seats in the the building. Uh, A new scoreboard is, is currently being designed. Um, there'll be enhancements to food and beverage environments. Um, we're adding a signature bar in Loud City. And so there's a lot of things that are going to energize the fan experience and yeah. to continue to show that evolution and that maturation over the next 18 to 24 months. So we're really excited for next year because we, we really see that there's a lot of wind at our backs. There's a lot of enthusiasm around the thunder. And so there's a sense of, of fresh interest, and, and that's energizing mm-hmm. our organization. Check one. <laughs> So we're really excited, yeah. as you can tell. Hey, guys, sorry to cut in here. Um, sorry to cut this one a little short. Uh, right as we were right as we were um, closing out this episode, as you heard, the sound team started setting up for the Spelling Bee event that was there that day. So we had to cut the audio short um, just to save your ears because they were, as you could kind of hear, screaming and shouting in the background, setting up for the sound system. Um, so huge shout-out to Brian for coming on the podcast. Um I'll link his previous episode in the show notes where we talk all about the branding. Brian's been with the Thunder since day one. He was sent here from day one um, from Seattle. So Brian talks a lot about kind of the color scheme, picking the name OKC Thunder, picking Rumble, like all of the things that go on behind the scenes, the stuff that we don't think about. You know, we just watch the basketball team, but all of the cool stuff that goes on behind. And I'll also link the episode I did with Christine Burney on the Thunder Cares side of all the impact stuff the Thunder does with the schools reaching out and the book program that they have and all the amazing stuff that they're doing, the courts that they have throughout the state as well. So I'll link those in the description down below. Again, sorry to cut this one a little short, but we got all the way to the end before they started um, setting up for the Smelling Bee, which is amazing. I mean, 30 kids come into the Paycom Center, you know, to have that special memory and have the, you know, Smelling Bee event in the arena is just fantastic, especially when it's like 30 kids. Like, come on, that's awesome. So thanks so much for listening. Huge shout out to Brian for coming back on the podcast. Um, look forward to doing more Thunder stuff in the future and we will catch you next episode. Cheers. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com and definitely on Instagram at oklahomahof. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, Follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.